Hey, everybody out there. Um, welcome to uh, this panel, panel on radical simulation. Uh, you know, uh, I'm Barry Through, Executive Director of Gray Area. Um, we're a 21st century countercultural institution focused on uh, cultivating communities of practice around applying creative action towards social transformation. Um, and so that means taking interdisciplinary practice through uh, art, science, technology, and the humanities and applying it towards some of the biggest challenges that we're facing today here in San Francisco. Um, so uh, we're happy to be a part of the grid um, and uh, thank you to the unique partners and everyone for putting this together and showcasing these local cultural organizations here in San Francisco. Um, so this panel today on radical simulation um, is informed by uh, about the last year of research we've been doing at Gray Area around this trend of experiential spaces in the US particularly, but kind of all over the world and this turn from objects to environments and the way artists are presenting and making their work. Um, and this uh, also means, you know, not both in just physical space, but now, um, and we'll get into this, uh, clearly driven by COVID, uh, increasingly in virtual and online spaces as well. Um, we did a year-long Knight Foundation supported research project uh, that took a group of artists um, and developed an experiential exhibition called The, uh, the End of You which focused on a lot of Gaian theory and how people's personal relationship to a living planet changed with that knowledge and how, um, you know, instead of this sort of thing like Instagram museums that started uh, this trend, um, things like Now Wolf, increasingly things like uh, Pace Gallery announced their new Super Blue initiative in Miami. So there's a lot of energy in this space. Um, but we were focused on sort of an anti-selfie museum and how to take this uh, multi-sensory sort of environment and use it to change people's, uh, transform people's personal perception of how they integrated with society and a living world and other species and other people. So that's just one example of the sort of thing that we're getting at um, with how are these sorts of spaces and environments used um, towards some sort of action or engagement with real world activities. So I'll introduce, um, we have a great group of people today sort of talking about their different um, practices and curations and um, processes of world building and how they're thinking through their work. Um, we have uh, Federico Solmi, who's um, a New York based artist. Hello, thanks for being with us. Uh, Melody, Hi, pleasure. yeah. Uh, Hi, Hi, Melody, um, who uh, is a virtual world builder, um, has a project called Hannah Hanna VR, which I'm sure she'll talk about, and um, most recently Patch XR, which is a uh, music um, synthesizer um, in VR. And then uh, moderating our panel today, I'm uh, happy to have with us Kalani Nicole. Um, who's the founder of Transfer Gallery and is also a festival designer that we're working with on, most importantly, our Gray Area Festival, uh, which opens in a couple of weeks, um, themed around this topic of radical simulation. Um, and so I hope I didn't miss anything there in way of introductions, and I'll pass it on to Kalani. Thanks so much, Barry. Uh, I'm really excited to be here with both of you and would love to just make space to start this off uh, hearing a little bit about your practice. Um, so Melody, if you'd like to begin, um, I have a video, but if you'd like to just uh, say a few words before we share that with the audience. Yeah, sure. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, so I'm Melody. Actually, I am uh, currently in uh, Linz uh, in uh, Ars Electronica, where it's quite uh, quiet uh, at the moment. Oh, you're actually. in Stadwerkstadt right now. Huh? You're not in Stadwerkstadt right now. You're... No, no, I went home because I had an um, internet problem there, and there is a lot of sound and noise going on there. Although there's not that much public, there are still installations and concerts. And yeah, I tried to give a, a talk yesterday from there and it didn't work out. So hopefully today it'll be more quiet. So yes, yeah, so I'm a contemporary artist. 
Um, I mean, I come from more like sculpture and I moved from object to more process-based art as I thought the most interesting part of my practice was never to exhibit the final object, but actually the, um, the process of making the object and what was the relationship that I was um, putting together and how I sort of designed this relationship uh, experience-based um, work. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, and then uh, I, I discovered virtual reality uh, in 2014 as I was uh, on an experience. I wanted to do uh, self-exploration uh, and I wanted to take out my organs. So I went to the doctor in Switzerland and asked them to do the MRI. And then I was able to make a virtual replica of my organs, which then I entered in a virtual world and I offered, the public was a, a, able to come and uh, navigate inside this surreal world that I built it and could actually enter my organs. And I really loved how um, I did not have to guide the experience. So it was like this open world and people could travel and explore and actually go in there um, have a lot of agency and creativity. So I fell into VR in this sandbox, creative, uh, exploring quest kind of thing. Um, and I got really hooked with the emotional re reaction and the engagement that the audience was going through VR. So my next work was another VR work called Hana Hana. And in that one, I wanted to take deeper the kind of psychogeographical experience. So it's a sort of surreal body uh, that you wouldn't recognize as a body, but the landscape itself, you know, it's, it's very feminine, um, let's say body. And the building blocks are hands and women's hands. So you are in this kind of Minecrafty, uh, uh, let's say, uh, gameplay where you can start constructing things, but things are hands. And um, the way I developed this work was that, I, same thing, I wanted people to explore things and to create stuff, um, but I also wanted it to be a collaborative experience. So my first version of Hana Hana was kind of a, an exquisite corp, is that how you say it in English? Ex corpo, um, exquisite? Corp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So basically, within the time of the exhibition, the world uh, would start growing and growing until the end of the exhibition, basically. So it starts as an empty desert in the surreal landscape, where with a lake of blood kind of thing. And then you can start sprouting these hands and make this sculpture out of hands for other people to explore. And it's really fun to do it for yourself, but then it's also really cool to discover what people's made before you. So kind of this world building was growing over the time of the exhibition. And then I wanted to take that work further. So I worked on it for a couple of years. So yeah, it had many iteration. It was this work in process, which I think I'm done with right now. I'm not making any change until maybe next version, or maybe we grow something else fruits or, or other body parts. But anyway, uh, the next um, iteration was uh, I wanted to work into multiplayer. So in order to connect different exhibition and different players together in real time in this like creative journey. And um, that's what I did. And this was very interesting because uh, I got to design the way people can create, communicate and move around together and kind of um, also find other ways to to follow each other, understand each other beyond speech. So one way that I used was to play with music. So basically I just developed another layer so you would create all these hands. Then hands that are facing each other would uh, create this plasma and then you can start grabbing the plasma and this becomes a music instrument that you can actually play over the network with people that could be in another exhibition in Paris or San Francisco or, or Japan or whatever. And then they would start grabbing this thing together and do this ritual, uh, playing this theremin, multiplayer theremin, and uh, they could call the, the rain and the, the thunderstorm and stuff like this. So it was uh, really fun. Um, 
Yeah, and this got me to my current work, which is a patch XR, uh, which is actually a collaborative. I mean, it's in between. Uh, okay, it's I'm an artist, but then in this project, I'm creating the tool uh, for other artists to to actually make this kind of work that I, I love to do. Because in fact, to make Hannah Hannah, this cost me a ton of money and was absolutely, um, you know, it was very expensive. It took me a lot of time and I don't have the coding knowledge to, to build this. So what I wanted to do, I teamed up with a friend that was working in, in making music stuff uh, in VR procedural music. So the same way I was making procedural visual. Um, okay, sorry, I'm talking too much. But anyway, um, maybe I can just show you what I'm doing right now. So it's like this patch XR music tool for other people to build music world in VR. Awesome, thank you so much. I'm gonna share the screen now so we can see right. that um, video here. So here it comes. Deep to the fundamentals of our engine, the building blocks. So everything we see here can be break apart and can be fully customized. This is something that was made by our users. So you can hear and by connecting wires, I can start a bit. Like I'm inside of the instrument and I can decide everything that happens here. Break it apart or expand it. So we can make music by building connections. Thank you. 
transform our voice and become those characters that we grew up watching on screen. And say things like. Okay. Wow. <laughs> so um, we're going to move from uh, intense audio simulation into video and check out Federico as well. Uh, and he's in his studio there in Bushwick. You see his work all behind him. Um, so please uh, tell us a little bit about your practice. And I'm also going to share on my screen the piece that you linked me to as well so the audience can see that installation. So uh, I'm uh, an artist uh, that uh, live and work in Brooklyn since uh, 1999. Um, I've been using uh, uh, technology, uh, particularly gaming technology, since uh, 2005. You know, uh, I start to uh, use gaming uh, because uh, I saw there was uh, uh, such an industry that was expanding and completely revolutionizing our society, and especially. Uh, I was very attracted to, uh, the, you know, the incredible quality uh, that uh, the graphic uh, are rich. Uh, and then, you know, basically, uh, since I was, uh, you know, an, a narrative, uh, interesting to narrative work, and in particular, short, short commentary work, I started to create short video uh, combining drawings and painting with uh, uh, digital technology. And uh, since then, I move, of course, also into VR, AR, and uh, I was able to bring uh, uh, in the past few years also some some of this uh, uh, major video work into um, you know public space like Times Square or uh, uh, you know other other square uh, in uh, in Europe. So in order to uh, basically use uh, video installation as a sort of like movie murals you know um my uh, my work of course like you know is very influenced by um you know the the fallibility of uh, of of the world in which we live often my work is dystopian uh, but also is very satirical and very funny i mean um but of course if you look uh, deep deeply uh, the message uh, is often very uh, harsh uh, and often uh, is an accusation toward uh, uh, the, f the false political uh, narrative of historical account. Uh, I tend to uh, love to destroy myths uh, that uh, often uh, appear in, uh, in books and in our society. And I do love to criticize American obs obsession and in general the Western world with uh, success and perfection and uh, to show how consumerism uh, is obnoxious and you know torture our life and our brain like you know so and of course like in the past five years uh, I start to um, work into revisiting and study American history and uh, I start to uh, around 2014-2015 to uh, explore with very funny and very critical uh, video about uh, some of the most uh, prominent name in the history in the United States, like George Washington, uh, the founding father. So basically, I, uh, with the help of like uh, gaming technology and creating this sort of like uh, uh, metaphysical uh, uh, and virtual space, I started to recreate my own history uh, and change the narrative, like, you know, way before, like, you know, Black Lives Matter and uh, all of these other things that happened, like, you know, so I use uh, this, uh, this war, this, uh, this, uh, this possibility of recreating this beautiful visual uh, image that they come in from gaming that, uh, uh, and I basically apply hand painted texture and I create my own hybrid war that, you know, they live, uh, 
um, in virtual space, but can also be experienced in gallery, in VR, you know. So that's more or less what I do. And I rather that, you know, maybe if you have some question, instead of like do a monologue that I'm uh, not also very good in monologue. <laughs> Sounds good. I appreciate the introduction to your work. Uh, as we were chatting before the panel, I first saw the work uh, at Postmasters Gallery, and I also yeah. love uh, the fact that you're painting also, and there's this physical element to your work, um, yeah, which is interesting because Melody talked about her shift from the object to process-based mm -hmm. work. So I think it's interesting that you're both working and addressing across those two different areas. Um, and yeah, you know, just for some context before we jump into discussion, um, I have been, as Barry mentioned, I have been working uh, with Gray Area to help kind of reinvent their festival, which is an annual festival that they've been doing for a lot of years now. Uh, we can't gather in San Francisco together this year, so we've been thinking about how to bring that experience online. Um, and uh, in general, you know, our topic is about world building and simulation. Uh, the festival's title this year is Radical Simulation. Um, and it touches on a lot of the issues that both of you talked about too, you know, um, any, anything from uh, notions of embodiment, like Melody, you're looking at a lot in your work um, and thinking also about, um, you know, politics and the context of our world now and how artists are using simulation to explore all of that. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen and flash yeah. for another second what we're working on at Gray Area so you can all see that. Um, one second, here we go. Yeah. Um, so uh, the festival will be in two weeks and um, we have some fabulous keynotes lined up and we're also doing something that's a bit unique. Um, we have a virtual performance, Antigon, um, which is occurs in real time on YouTube. It's very cool. It's kind of audience driven from within a simulation. And then all of our artists will also, um, our featured presentations will also be from within their virtual worlds. Um, and as we're doing that, we're gonna be bringing everyone together also into a new simulated space, which we're calling lounges, which are face-to-face -face organic interactions. That's kind of what we all miss in this era of Zoom where we're locked in boxes with no way to kind of fluidly move throughout conversations. Um, we're still in boxes in that situation, but we hopefully have a way to come together and have those kinds of great kind of hallway talks that happen at these kinds of festivals and gatherings. Um, so I'm just gonna stop my screen now. That's some context for what um, what I've been up to with Gray Area. Um, so I would love just to start off the conversation um, if all of you can tell me a little bit about how you um, think about uh, your work in the context of COVID and how it has been affected or not and how you're kind of leveraging simulation to explore these new ways that we're working um, today. Well, you know, to be honest, uh, there is a lot of great things that happened uh, during the COVID, especially uh, for, uh, you know, a person like me that was engaging too many events, too many art fairs, too many, uh, you know, exhibition and the things that immediately um, was the positive element is that finally I have time to become more intimate with my work. And this is a fantastic thing, you know, because... Uh, uh, you know, my studio was often like we were seven to ten assistant, and now, like you know, uh, I have uh, you know most of the people they are they work remotely, and uh, I have to say I enjoy tremendous. You know, I feel again that I am an emerging artist. Try to uh, you know taking gamble, try to find new um, opportunity to. Uh, develop my work and it's a very amazing experimental time for me. So uh, for me, I always create virtual uh, works since uh, 15 years. So nothing has, has changed as much. And, you know, probably the, the biggest difficulty is that, uh, um, you know, like uh, a lot of the art market is based on sales and, and the art fair where, where the revenue work mostly were coming from. But to be honest, like, you know, uh, again, I feel this is a, an incredible opportunity to to rethink about the whole uh, the whole uh, career, the whole uh, experience that I did in 20 years in New York, and I think uh, I feel a much better man today. Like you know, uh, mm -hmm. and this is this break, this uh, this uh, uh, 
constriction, uh, I just feel like, you know, it's been like a, uh, like a treasure, like, you know, and of course, you know, we have to um, reinvent a way to support our career because, uh, you know, I, I have a tremendous amount of bills to pay, like with, uh, with all of this uh, hiring, uh, developer, Unity developer, 3D, uh, 3D uh, modeler, um, you know, so, but again, I, you know, I mean, I'm very positive, you know, uh, beside the financial aspect, you know, so I think uh, it's a life change in a very positive way. So I don't know if my answer yeah. over all the topics, but uh, I get emotional. I, I'm enjoying this moment. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the notion of time opening up, I think, resonates with me in a way, or time expanding how we think about time and time for us to spend in different ways, which maybe we hadn't before. Um, and Melody, I'm curious if, if you've had any similar experiences or kind of how you're thinking about your practice now in these times. Mm, yeah, well, I have to say that in February, um, I mean, beginning of March when everything got canceled, uh, I, I felt relieved extremely because I was going to travel like two times around the world in, in like two weeks. And, I may, you know, I just had like, as you were saying, like just, you know, going from Austin uh, for South by Southwest to GDC to London. I was just like had too many shows and way too many things like piling up. So the first the first month was just like, wow, nice. Actually, I don't have to do all this. Um, but um, then for me, it was not such a, a relieving time for so long because actually Anna Hannah it was just finished to be produced. And now it was a time for kind of exhibiting this multiplayer and developing like a much more uh, consequent installation that I could actually, you know, somehow, yeah, make it travel and kind of, yeah, leverage all this work. And VR was not the best time at all for at the moment, yeah. Um, so yeah, for me it was not such a, a good thing, but so this is on my personal practice, let's say. Um, one thing that I did that I actually thought was a beautiful experience and uh, COVID or no COVID, it didn't matter. I uh, leveraged on a, a, a pipe, like a water pipe that was getting emptied, like a water pipe, like a, from a dam, like a, how do you call it, an electric, uh, how do you call it? The power plant, a power plant uh, in the mountain in Switzerland that was getting emptied out and, and clean. And I was like, okay, cool, I'm gonna go to the mountain. And I asked the guy if I could cross the ton, like one of the pipe, like a seven kilometer pipe in full darkness alone. Uh, and you know, without the light. So I went through this tunnel and walked for an hour, um, a little bit more than an hour alone going through this tunnel. And this was a beautiful experience. It's an artwork that doesn't really have a, a form, just an experience and a very cool story. The idea that never in my life I was gonna be able to walk in full darkness and complete confidence mm -hmm. was such a, but also kind of a metaphorical, uh, a journey within like an introspection of you going inside yourself like within full confidence but as you're walking through a mountain so anyway this i guess not having to travel gave me the opportunity to do this kind of experience that kind of nourish my work anyway so this was a good thing but that what happened on patch so that was the most amazing thing so basically because we patched we allow musicians somehow to collaborate and like basically for musicians it was terrible because all the gigs were cancelled no concert whatsoever so okay there was this music live online on zoom and whatever but what was amazing is that we were able to allow musicians to kind of collaborate with each other using vr and using our tool and when we did this first hackathon which usually would have taken place in Berlin uh, for the Maze Festival and would have been a local event with local artists, which would have been great. But because everything was online, we uh, had an open call and we had artists from Colombia, Iran, uh, Iran, uh, from Montreal, from Poland, from like Mexico. And so basically we ended up with a crowd of artists from all around the world collaborating together. And this was 
due to the situation and the technology we're offering is also enabling them to kind of get you know in the more immersive space and connect to their audience in you know with different yeah in a, in a constructed world uh, that we can help them do uh, create so yeah that, that was very really positive thank you if i can say something yeah uh, well one of the things to me that happened is really fantastic like you know uh, is that uh, i always said you know real estate in new york is very expensive of course like you know and you know i have a good size studio but i always felt that you know since i work with large piece now i have a piece here that is 20 feet wide and um, i was able for the first time again in 15 years to have all of the digital uh, studio to be remotely so i have uh, two uh, main guys that are working on uh, on unity and uh, and uh, other platform that completely we work, they work remotely. And to me, this is a huge thing because usually I always have, you know, two to three people working on, uh, on uh, computers and they constantly interrupt me, constantly, uh, anything I do. And it was very frustrating, like, you know, very frustrating. This to me has been huge that, you know, I can come here and I can do a full day of work without, uh, you know, we do screen share, you know, Constantly, I check, of course, like, you know, the progress, but uh, this has been huge. Personally, I don't miss at all the traveling. Like, you know, the traveling is necessary, especially when you're younger, to do PR, to meet this, to meet, you know. But at the same time, man, how much time you waste, like, you know, uh, to go to Miami, Basel, to go to uh, all of these uh, yeah. events, you know. <laughs> I don't miss it either. I really believe, <laughs> I really believe yeah. that... I really believe that uh, also this, uh, you know, like irrational way of like uh, of working, like, you know, it is, yeah, it creates huge anxiety, which, you know, in my case, they work, you know, they help me. But at the same time, like, you know, so much waste of time, like, you know, so much waste of time, you're constantly in a run. So, for example, if you want to make an example, which I'm absolutely not compare myself to any of this, but uh, Picasso would never travel, like, you know, he was always... In his studio, he, you know, this this way of like working and preparing the pieces for the art fair and blah 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 blah, is it, a very distorted way of working too. Yeah. Like, you know, so to me, okay. the disaster for me for 2020 is not that everything is glamorous and beautiful. I had four solo museum exhibition planning so in 2020, um, and they all gone. You know, I have the best museum event of all of my life, including the Smithsonian event, which has been closed for the past uh, uh, seven months. It's been a disaster on, on that, on that uh, side, like, you know. But at the same time, like, you know, I feel after 20 years of trying to become uh, an artist, because I'm, I was a self-educated artist and I, I had quite a bit of struggle to be accepted in the art system. Uh, and then, uh, becoming established, trying to become more established and trying to get to a museum, to a, a better museum, to find a gallery in LA, to find a gallery in Europe. So I feel like, you know, man, like, you know, this is fantastic. Like, you know, now it's time to, you know, to to revise, to look at the work that I built in 20 years and, and see what I did right, what I did wrong. For example, like now, I've been oh, going to... Uh, just wanna, I just want to go ahead and try to move on the conversation a little yes. bit because we have a couple more yes. conversations. Sorry to Sounds have good. here and I think a lot to kind of unpack. So, um, okay. you know, what, what I want to talk about now is how can world building, which you're both doing in your practice, become a tool for thinking? And specifically, what role does your work serve in the context that we've just been discussing? Um, world building, I mean, like, you know, I, uh, sim simulation, like in general, like, you know, well, like, you know, listen, you know, um, I give an example. I, I'm not a gamer. I, I never play games, you know. So, but when uh, in 2003, I think, uh, uh, and some of the audience will remember that uh, GTA Grand Theft Auto came out with uh, uh, this one of his first. I think was the second one or the first one. I was shocked to see, you know, that uh, through like uh, uh, gaming technology, they could experience, uh, uh, you know, driving a car get into the car, change the radio station, uh, see like, you know, Brooklyn, see New York, uh, you know, 
uh, what an artist try to uh, to build you know in my case or i think in many cases they try to use uh, you know this sort of like world building to create a better world to create uh, a world that uh, uh, works for our sensibility like you know for example when i use gaming technology or vr and r to to show how historical narrative were falsified you know um it's fantastic you just take reality you tweak it and uh, 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 no, actually, you don't take reality because they're already, uh, you know, manipulated. You take a manipulator uh, history, you bring it into a platform like uh, VR, and then you change uh, the role of some of these uh, leaders. Like, you know, so you transform George Washington from like an incredible myth. You just show the negative side of him. So, uh, you know, in a way, you try to make your own justice, like, you know, uh, with uh, using this war builder, like, you know, so, and of course, uh, you stimulate a visual conversation about history, you know, and, mm -hmm. and you like, you know, you try to, uh, you know, with this weird and bizarre image, you try to uh, invoke the viewer to say, hey, but maybe we should look history in a more profound way. Like, you know, so, you know, th th this is it's the role of like, uh, the, I think the artist to, to try to engage the viewer and show a, a different uh, side of, uh, of, of the war and uh, you know that's that's how I get into it to, to I, I wanted to be a narrator I was interested in to engage in the viewer like you know and sometimes the gallery system is not enough you have to engage it in in square in public square in subway mm -hmm. station like you know I, I love this you know, so. mm -hmm. thank you and melody can you talk a little bit about how you use world building as a tool for thinking in your work yeah I'm not actually sure uh, um uh, how to understand the question because I mean the way I I feel like when you're building a world it's a it's a it's a thinking process I mean it's a it's a it's a yeah it's a materialization of your thinking as you're combining elements of sound and visual and in my case a lot of sensory element like uh, I'm really into haptic feedback and and playing with uh, transformation of the self and of the user which is going through the experience and how he can experience himself in different uh, ways so uh, not just like embodying the body of a man or, or a black woman or uh, uh, or uh, you know it's not about just sw switching bodies and embodying another person but really um, trying to tweak uh, your sensation and how um you're exp you know like for instance in the real world we're functioning with uh, world like earth physics and sounds travel with uh, earth physics sound uh, uh, whatever uh, lows and uh, what i love with uh, creating world is that you can rethink those and you can start playing with how it feels to actually going through spaces that have different lows gravities uh, where your hands can be there or can be there or actually can move slower than your actual hand in the real world and and you can grab objects that are way far away from you and get them close i mean rethinking all these ways of interacting with the world and give let other people experience this and, and actually even in my case let them create the experience they want to test for themselves is what I found fascinating. Um, yeah. So is it yeah. thinking? I don't know. It's I'm more in the experiential aspect of thinking or discovering or transforming yourself as you're going through the work or whatever. Yeah, I, I really appreciate the perspective. And actually, uh, it's a great segue because the next question is about how making art with environments is different than making objects. Um, and so I'm curious if you have any further thoughts on that and what that shift was like for you in your practice. For me or for her? Uh, for her first, and then we'll come up. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, yeah, environment and not object. Yeah, I mean, I still like to make object once in a while. I love to, you know, work with bronze and, and touch, you know, the hot, uh the hot uh, wax so when i make a bronze sculpture or when i i work with clay so you know 
but of course, when you're working with an environment, the thing is like, it, you're, of course, you want to have the world to look beautiful and to, you know, at the end, you know, you're looking at the aesthetic and the, you're looking at the final object within the environment that you're creating as well. But there is more layers, um, you know, there is the, I mean, because what, the more agency you give to to um, the user or the player or the, the art spectator, whatever you call it in that, in that case, um, I mean, the less control you have on the object itself, uh, because that's all about his decision and what he wants to go through, what he wants to look at, what he wants to interact with. And I'm really much into not forcing and really let the person, you know, do his own uh, thing. Um, yeah, but I really love the um, kind of putting together the context. Um, yeah, yeah, but that's my take on it. Thank you. And. Federico, your your work like literally merges the two, right? The physical act yeah. of painting and and video and and the environments and, and the art you're using from that. So, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I feel like you know, in, you know, I've always been into this world that is uh, a combination of tangible and intangible. Like you know, so for example, like you know, um, uh, uh, people uh, know my video work, you know, but the video work is uh, is made with, uh, with with paintings, like you know. Uh, that they are mounted on uh, uh, onto 3D digital model. So, uh, to me, the difference between uh, an object that uh, uh, and like an ex an experience, an intangible work, is very is very simple, at least in my work. So, a painting. Let me see. A painting, which is these are in progress. A painting doesn't move. You know, doesn't move. And to me, which I'm a narrator. I like to uh, tell a story, uh, you know, it's very important that uh, uh, I'm obsessed with moving image, you know, because uh, my real interest, it is uh, uh, really to, to, to tell a story. And uh, of course, uh, um, of course, like, you know, when you're able to bring this story into a huge scale, um, you know, it's like a dream come true, like, you know, so, um I love both like you know in a way I'm I'm very attached to the labors my hand the using of the hands but at the same time uh, all of this virtual exhibition uh, that I've been involved like you know or uh, this uh, uh, video installation that are into like major publics uh, building like you know uh, it really helped me to get my work closer to the everyday uh, uh, people and this is amazing. For example, when I did a big installation in Frankfurt, I remember in one of the main square, uh, I remember that uh, you know there was this 120 feet uh, video installation, and there was like a like you know a train that cut uh, almost the installation. Like you know, and I see the people coming off of the bus that they were like you know uh, shocked to see like uh, art into into like you know a public space. You know. And can you hear me? Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, you know. um, I um, I want to start to move the conversation in a direction where we're talking about the community around it. Um, and I'm curious uh, how your work builds and supports community. Uh, it's something that's really important to me in my work, especially as a gallerist. I see as a modern gallerist, bringing people together is really my role. Um, and bring people together around simulations is always a little bit of a dance. Uh, it's become very different in our virtual world. Um, but uh, yeah, so, um, sorry, I just lost my train of thought there, uh, looking at this chat thing. Um, so I'm curious if you can talk about how your work helps build and support community. Melody, if you want to start, obviously you're doing a highly collaborative process and the work itself seems to have a community behind it, empowering it. Um, so we'd love to hear, hear more about that. Yeah, so I mean, Patch is all about the community, uh, in fact, because it's a tool um to build sonic world so uh, it's all about the, com the the creators that are behind and that are using the tool and that make the tool 
so transform itself as well because since it's not released or anything yet so at the moment we have a small community like maybe 20 20 to 25 uh, musicians builder media artists and artists as well i mean it's still quite complex and you know the whole thing is based on sound and audio logic so um you know people who are accustomed to pure data max msp or this kind of uh, um like procedural sound uh, software we would find quite easy to start building from scratch uh, in patch uh, their own engine and instrument and world uh, for the artists like me it's still a little bit tedious so now we actually we have a good community of builder we call them builder slash audio geek uh, so those ones they love patch and they're using it and they're doing concerts and they're playing with each other. And actually the thing is like, it's just a text file at the end. So patch our tool is a, is almost like just a, it's reading the file and then making it into 3D, but it's actually super light to, it's like a GitHub kind of thing. So you can just exchange text file and just, you can try the work that somebody made. You can, you can customize it. You can keep working on it and you can play it and then you can stream it broadcast yourself or whatever make video or immersive vr experiences whatever you want and these people the building the builder musician producer they're really cool with using patch right now although not so many people have vr and the pc that goes with the vr uh, that's still the problem for the community at the moment because most musicians are using mac um and yeah so that's the limitation right now. And the next step, because what the way we got together with Edo, which is my partner, which you heard in the video. Um, so he was coming from sound and I'm coming from the visual art. And basically when we come together, the idea that is both our communities can uh, leverage our tool. So my job now when I'm working with this is really to to get this logic of sound and the, all the complexity way more intuitive so people like me or you know less tech savvy artists and creators can start building with a, a lot of intuitivity but what was really cool so when we started to make the when we did this hackathon there was half of them were producer and kind of sound engineer or kind of people and then the other half were more visual artists and what happened is that they got into teams and they, they, so some worked more on the visual aspect and some really created the scenes and the sound and, and the whole like engineering uh, behind uh, what you see. And when they come together it was amazing. So actually as a tool to bring community together of, you know, different kind of skill and, and sensitivity and stuff like this uh, was really powerful. So that's something we, we were, super happy and we found that was a success in this last experience of sharing the the software so yeah community and you know the whole when we release actually what we want is that uh, people publish their work exchange it with each other and we imagine this like ever-growing library of content which you know like yeah so but it, thriving Patrick, community. um it's not just it, is it also a platform for an audience to experience the music or are you just thinking about it as a tool for people to create the music? Yeah, no, so it's both. And that's really what we're trying. So there is really this, the consumer aspect, which means like, okay, I'm a VR enthusiast or I'm an art lover or music lovers. I don't want to make music, but I want to experience the work of my favorite artists then I can really go on this sonic journey and access, you know, whatever content has been created by the community. I mean, of course we need to, to find a way to curate uh, how the work goes out there because, you know, a lot of patches are just not so interesting or they're just, you know, it takes some time to polish a world that we actually want to be at the platform, but that would be something we have to develop as we, moving forward in the process but no the idea that there is really the the journey of the consumer or you know the the one that is here to experience and then there is the the tool which is this sandbox thing where you can start you know spawning your own component and start patching 
and adding visual to your sound and, and build. And there's another layer. It's actually the tweaking part. So it's like, OK, maybe I don't want to start my machine from scratch, but I want to play someone's machine, or I want to start just making it my own and tweak a few parameters and, and you know, so that's the a higher level uh, creative author, like authoring uh, level. But the cool thing would actually to bring these people together under the same kind of ecosystem. So, you know, as the same, you know, let's say your gallery uh, is the place where the artists and the, the public join. Well, in patch, what, that's kind of what we're trying to recreate, this space where you can build, you can discuss, you can chat, you can share, and you can experience people's work as well. It's quite ambitious. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's also very reflective of the way that we all work in these spaces and with these technologies, right? It takes uh, a lot of collaboration to put together these kinds of projects and the communities and resources that come together around that are a big part of how it happens, right? Um, mm -hmm. Kind of like inherent in the process. So uh, Fed, did you have anything that you wanted to add when you think about a community uh, well, I, around I, the world? You know, I, just very briefly, like uh, uh, I don't want to be repetitive. Of course, when you uh, try to create a political work, uh, narrative work, uh, you want to try to engage community. And uh, when you go into, uh, you know, a public square, I think one of the things that uh, um, I engage a lot with community for sure, like you know, is my experience uh, uh, of teaching uh, that helped me to reach out the younger generation. I did. Uh, quite a bit of work at Yale University, School of Art and School of Drama. And another thing that we cannot underestimate, uh, I think, is the online community, uh, since we are talking about, uh, like, you know, uh, virtual experience. For example, like, you know, a simple tool like Instagram, uh, you really, you know, I have many people that uh, they thanked me to, to share uh, the process of how I make the work, you know, to simply post, uh, a work in progress and unveil uh, what kind of software, what kind of like uh, animation, what kind of like, uh, uh, you know, uh, digital tool you're using, uh, in a way is really like, you know, engaging uh, with the community. And I feel like, you know, uh, this is something that uh, uh, people are eager uh, to, to share, to learn, you know, and um, yeah, this is the only thing that, you know, I think that uh, we cannot underestimate the, you know, even the high school kids that uh, is trying to become an artist and uh, uh, the parents, they, they tell him, like they told me that it's impossible to become an artist. And by seeing an artist that is able to make a living and hiring people, this is 10 times better than going to a Yale MFA, you know, for sure. Like, you know, in my opinion, like, you know, which I never had, you know, uh, I never went to college, but uh, for some lucky circumstance and I was able to, to become a professor at Yale University. Uh, but, uh, but, but that's the social media, the younger generation, they love to learn from, uh, by watching other people working, you know, how amazing it is, you know. How amazing is this that, you know, you can and they can shoot you question like, you know, this is amazing. When I came here to New York it was complete isolation. There is no nobody to to call, nobody to ask. Nobody will open the door to you and uh, and show you what we were working on it. Now it's all open. Like, you know, and there is some artists like me that love to 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 share, you know, the secret, because I always said, who is the crazy person that will try to imitate what I do? They need to hire 10 people. They need to have hundreds of thousands of dollars to create video. And I said, I'll share it. I don't care, you know? So good luck if you wanna to try to do the same thing. I'm happy for you, like, you know, so anyway. I love, I, yeah, I love that you brought up online community too. And I'm, I'm curious, like for both of you, how that's shifted. Like for me, what I observe a lot in the art world is that 
Uh, people are sort of just like pushing out content, publishing a lot, and what it means to still gather together. We haven't quite figured that out. Um, Co-presence mm -hmm. in an online way, whereas like for decades, those of us in in the net art world have been gathering online in communities very organically. So um, I'm curious, like where you find communities online in this time, and and what kind of relationship that has also to your work. For me. Mm -hmm. Uh, for either of you, I mean, I know Melody's project is largely that community, but I wonder if there are other places that you gather with people and, and how you're finding that and connect mm. to that community online. Hmm. Well, the thing is, for instance, with my team, uh, nobody is in the same country. <laughs> so yeah. most of my relation, uh, my working relation first are uh, completely uh, digital and remote. Uh, so we don't have, like, so I'm just so used to just like have this kind, you know, when Corona happened for me, it didn't make any difference on my workflow. It was, you know, it's, it's completely the opposite of you. Uh, like I don't, I hardly don't have a studio. So everything is just happening through calls and, you know, so some tools, online tools. So yeah, I don't know. I feel like I have a, a low, uh, life outside of, of the digital world yeah i don't know like a community like i tell you an example like you know and you might know uh you know i work all, i work all the time you know so um i love what i do and uh, even in during normal time like you know uh, even not the virtual community uh, i'm talking about the real community is it's very hard to to do everything like you know so what i'm trying to say that even in the pre-COVID world, like, you know, uh, the reality of, uh, let's say, an artist like me is really like, you know, I tend to enjoy uh, uh, to work in the studio. And my biggest uh, companion are my assistant, you know, which we go into, you know, conversation. And But the reality is that, you know, I, I, I'm very involved uh, um, in to follow every step of the process. And plus, I have a family, like, you know, I, I don't. I don't feel lonely at all. I just love to, to you know. The only my my only companion is to, to try to see exhibition, to try to, uh, to see what new technology that came out. You know, but I don't have the 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 passion of trying to engage in into an online. I don't know. Like uh, I don't know. I just feel. I feel like I'm very secluded in a way. Like you know, I have the privilege of being in uh, in New mm -hmm. York uh, where. A lot of things are happening and now a lot of things are happening online and I'm very happy for for the people that don't have to leave the burden of being in mm. New York. Um, and um, yeah, I think like, you know, um, mm. I feel uh, I feel pretty good also mm. a lot in my studio, which uh, before the COVID never happened, like, you know, so maybe it's a transitional moment, of course. But you know, for did you try any of this uh, Mozilla Hub uh, exhibition, like this kind of uh, virtual, like VR chat gathering or on well, other did. type of like immersive? Yeah, thing? what did you think? What was your opinion of those? Well, you know, listen, I, I did like a, in LA, like a, a beautiful uh, a project, like was, it's like sort of like, a, how they call it, like a, a viewing room, you know? Uh, and I did, uh, uh, virtual gallery exhibition in Europe. So uh, I don't know, like, uh, again, like, you know, would you rather to look at an online fair? I, I personally, I don't care, you know, so okay. uh, it, it's very limited uh, uh, at the moment. Like I rather listen to an artist speaking, like, you know, absolutely like a panel. I will join in a second, but to go and see a 3D rendering of, uh, of an exhibition with, uh, it's, I'm, you know, I don't know. It just doesn't fulfill me. Like, you know, okay. uh, Melody, what about you? What's your experience? We're just going to wrap too. So maybe yeah. we can get a final thought there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was actually quite curious and excited about uh, all these uh, artists going uh, into Mozilla Hub and creating their own world and, and, uh, and their own studio. Like I did a couple of studio visits uh, inside Mozilla Hubs and I, I actually really enjoyed it. Uh, I mean, I love the uncanny situation, like the avatar completely glitching, like the low res. Uh, but I, I also love the experience, like it's just completely sci-fi. Um, 
and it, it and I do feel like uh, um, empathy is uh, is going through the device, and I did feel empathy for for this artist that I was meeting in their own little private space that they designed to to have these meetings, and I love that their character was just glitching and sometimes up on the sky and then back on my feet, and I thought it was it was cute. <laughs> I'm afraid um, we're uh, at time here, um, and I think they have other panels coming up. So I'm going to have to thank everybody. Thank, uh, thank you, you Melody. Thank you, Federico. Thank you, Kalani. Thank you, um, we have we're going to continue this conversation at Gray Area Festival starting in about a week and a half. Um, everybody should go to GrayAreaFestival.io and check that out. And we'll be back tomorrow with the Grid with a panel on universal basic income that I think is going to be fantastic at uh, 11 a.m. Pacific time uh, that everybody should check out. And I think that's about it. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.